Okay, here we are. Two distinct moments in time space coming together through an asynchronous pressing of buttons. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If you're new to the show today, welcome to you. Thanks to everyone else for returning. I wonder how you're doing. Are you doing okay? I really am amazed at how time has been happening these days. It occurs to me that last week when I was with you, I was in Virginia. (laughs) And I, I just ducked into the bedroom for a moment and tried to make an intro and outro. It seems like a million years and no time at all has gone by since then. Time's just speeding up and slowing down and swirling around. And then here I am again. I'm in my attic, talking into a microphone again. It's like an anchor point (laughs) in the chaos of it all. And maybe it would be like that for other people. Maybe listening to this show could feel like some kind of anchoring point. I don't know. It has felt like a particularly challenging period. I just recently recorded a conversation that you'll hear in a few weeks with someone who was the second episode ever on this show. And it was seven years ago. In like two months, it'll mark seven years since I started doing this show. And at that time, when I started it, I was just entering into this inflection period, this this point of inflection in my adult life, you know? If you've been around since the beginning, there are a few of you, I'm sure, who might remember. And then I just kind of, I went through that whole turn on the show. And then now it feels like they talk about seven-year cycles sometimes, right? And it feels like that I'm, I'm entering into this inflection. And it's different this time, though. It's not just like my own thing because it's so tied into my daughter and my family. And, and just so many people I know are in ordeals of their own, too. Certainly seems like... There's a lot of reckoning happening and it's such a strange paradox to me how my life could feel so in crisis, but then at the same time, it, it kind of is propelling me into my life in this very immediate way. I'm more present in my life right now than I think I might have ever been in my life out of just pure necessity, you know, in a a desperate need to rise to the moment. (laughs) Wow. Well, I do really hope that things are maybe a little bit easier for you, or if they're not, that at least you could see the paradox in it as well. I've really been looking for conversations to help me sort through a lot of what seems to be happening. And today's conversation is no exception. My guest is Harmony Slater from the Finding Harmony podcast. And I believe it was a listener of this show who sent me an email and said why you should check out Harmony's podcast. And I did. And originally I reached out to Harmony like a while back, you know, some might have even been months ago. I can't really remember, but I reached out to her because she was a yoga teacher who had a podcast. She's, you know, in the Ashtanga world more. And I just wanted to try to, I don't know, touch base with like the yoga world. Like you've heard me say it on this show in previous weeks and months, like, 
is there a yoga world anymore? Like, I feel like it's gone. Like, I don't know. I can't tell <laughs> if there's any such a thing as a yoga community or yoga communities out there. And I was just reaching out to see if other teachers feel like they are tapped into anything. So I sent her an invitation and then a while went by and then she answered the invitation and decided to come on. And then all this stuff's been going on in my life, you know? So, you know, we certainly talk about some yoga world stuff and like the evolution of like lineage traditions and, and a way for like modern Western practitioners to try to like process stuff that's happened, you know? But then it, it turned into um, something else. It wasn't really just about the yoga world. It's one of these wonderful conversations where I don't know this person at all, but I just engage them as though they are a friend and ask the most pressing, honest questions about what I'm interested in. And I felt like Harmony and I came to a really great place together and I was very grateful to make the connection. I'm happy to be sharing it with you today. Before we get to that, I do want to make a point of expressing some gratitude to our podcast premium subscribers. I just mentioned I've been doing this show for seven years and I don't think I would still be doing it if there weren't people out there who were supporting it through their subscriptions. If you're newer to the show, you can see the most recent 52 episodes are always free on the public feed. If you wanted to get to the archives and you wanted to support the show, you would become a podcast premium subscriber. It's choose your rate, cancel at any time. And actually, we're not really strict about stuff. And if you wanted to get to the older episodes and you didn't have any money, all you do is you email us and ask and we'll definitely give you a free account. But... For those of you out there, people like Monica Haskell and Palvinder Rao, shout out to you, Monica and Palvinder, for people like that who, who do subscribe, it, it's incredibly helpful and I appreciate it. If you want to learn about how to become a podcast premium subscriber or you want to find out about any of the other stuff I do, ongoing classes and facilitating discussions, all the stuff that I offer. Everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that is it for now. I will touch base with you on the other side. If you want to check in with me a little bit more today, we'll, we'll do it on the other side. But first, let's go ahead and get to it. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Harmony Slater. Hello? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Harmony. I think you're, the calendar you sent me a different Zoom link, so I was in a different Zoom room, so oh, I'm glad really? you sent the link, yeah. Oh, that's strange. I know, weird, I'm right? Sure that happened. Wow, that's a weird, quirky thing. I don't I recall know. that ever happening before, but I know. I, I even looked I even looked at it, and I was like, okay, oh. 1070, and the link that you sent me was like 0735. I was like, oh, I'm not in the right place. Oh, I was just about to send you an there's email. There's a gremlin in the machine today. I've had so many weird tech issues with Zoom today, so I'm just not even surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I am already recording, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to consider us having just begun. Is that cool with you? Sure. Why not? All right, cool. <laughs> well, you have a podcast. You know, I don't know how you do it, but a lot of times people have like, off the air banter and then like a formal intro and I don't like to do any of that stuff. So I like to let oh. people know. I don't like to take them by surprise. That's good. I'm glad you told me though. <laughs> cause, cause I always have a lot of informal banter. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I never used to tell anybody because it was an early time in podcasting and nobody even really had listened right. to them very much. <laughs> yeah. So nobody expected there to be off banter, air banter necessarily. And also I think there would always be this nice moment where someone would say, are we going to start? And I would say, we already have. And it would be kind of this nice thing. Right. But now 
sometimes people <laughs> say shit they don't want it on there you know and I it's like, true it's true i want to make sure <laughs> you know we're live or whatever yeah well everyone knows our the zoom link that we're on now so we can just <laughs> well, jot that be, down <laughs> it'll be gone we won't have to worry about anybody I jumping know. into our zoom <laughs> meeting but um in any case it is nice to meet you thanks for taking up my invitation yeah you as well i was really excited to get your invitation well, you know, I was thinking about, I was like, I want to reach out to other yoga teachers out there who are, and maybe even other yoga teachers who are also have a podcast, honestly, mm -hmm. because I just, when I started doing this seven years ago, there was a, a couple of other folks, you know, but a lot of yeah. them haven't kept it up after all these years, you know? It's and a I, lot of work, isn't it? It? <laughs> it? it is. I mean, you can get into a groove as it seems like you have some. Yeah. Um, but it is, is a fair amount of work. And yeah. um, I've just been feeling kind of like lonely. I'm like, where are the other yoga teacher podcasters out there? And I had uh, Andy Keen on not too long ago. I don't know if you know him. And yeah, I, yeah. And I also just felt like, I don't know, at another time years ago in doing the show, it felt like there were these like really distinct communities, right? There was the Ashtanga community and the Iyengar community. And, and maybe there's right. little, there's still some of that, but not really, not like it was. Mm. It feels yeah. like everybody's very siloed or something. <laughs> so in any case, yeah. you I think COVID has a lot to do with that. Absolutely. <laughs> it does. There, I mean, that's without saying, but yeah. I think that, um, I had actually like a listener reach out to me and say, have you listened to Harmony Slater's podcast? I was like, Aww. no, I haven't. But I went and listened to a bunch of episodes and I actually listened to a few because I sent you that invitation a little while back. Yes. Um, but I it went took, back. It takes me a while to get to all my, my, <laughs> you know, I know you have a little one and I, yeah. I know how this stuff goes. So uh, it was an open invitation, but yeah, I think that, you. I wanted to really compliment you on something. And it goes to what I was just saying about yoga communities. Mm. And because I listened to like an episode or two back when, when I first sent you the invitation and then <laughs> getting ready to talk to you today, I listened to a couple more very recent ones. Mm -hmm. And one of those was your recent episode with Eddie Stern. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I really just want to like bring attention to that, to like the listeners of this show, because I really thought it was a very significant um, conversation that you had with him. Like mm. I felt very moved by it. Like I'm not even in the Ashtanga community like that yeah. necessarily, but like just the reflection, it was very honest mm -hmm. and it just, I don't know, it spoke to so much of like, I've been, it's a theme on the show I've been talking about for the last two years, really about people reconciling, you know, mm -hmm. how yeah. you like learned a good thing from somebody, but then they also did bad shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then also even like the, or how things got bigger and institutionalized and standardized. Mm. Yeah. And like the hierarchy that you guys talked about and all that. So in any case, I just wanted to compliment you on that because I thought it was a very significant conversation. I, I encourage people to go listen to it. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's, that's really nice. Yeah, it was a, it was powerful and it was interesting. You know, the responses too are, are always interesting. You know, people's, people's reactions to these conversations are, mm. are kind of fascinating too because it brings up a lot of feelings for people, um, you know, both sort oh, of I positive <laughs> and negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what did it bring up for you? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it was, it was good. Eddie and I have known each other for quite some time. Not that we've had, had like a close relationship because he's in New York and I'm sort of in the Midwest in, in Canada. So, um, you know, I've never really been his student, but, you know, we've met each other in Mysore. We've met each other on tour. I've taken a, you know, workshop with him, different workshops that he's taught. Um, so, I mean, we, we've known each other for, for, I don't know, maybe 20 years or something, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it, I kind of sort of had an inkling of where he was going with it just because I do sort of pay attention to, um, you know, what he's up to online and different sort of things that he's doing and, and the direction that he's moving in. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was interesting. I, I felt like it was 
good in many ways, but I also felt a little bit um, like just personally, this is a little bit maybe too honest, but we'll just go there. Why not? Um, <laughs> I also felt a little bit like, you know, he was sort of the, in our community, sort of this, I mean, he built the community. Let's just put it that way, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and and so his sort of, I guess, renunciation in a certain sense of, of um, you know, the the palace that he created <laughs> mm. um, was very, I don't know, it was interesting. It made me sort of feel a little bit like, you know, so much came from this teacher, Patabi Joyce, your whole career and reputation and fame and fortune really was built on his teaching style and method and your relationship to his teaching style and method. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I always feel a little bit weird when people are just are able to like kind of completely disassociate from that. Too quick a pivot, huh? Too quick a pivot. (laughs) Yeah. Or just like, (laughs) yeah, it just, it feels a bit, it feels a bit um, strange to me. Yeah. Because it's, I don't know. It's like a family member, right? Yeah. How can you just like disown your family member? I know, but I, I guess I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I think that others would probably agree that, that he should be held more accountable or something. But, and I, I think in the past I, I had that view, but I definitely softened on it. Yes. Yes, for sure. I mean, and that's, and that's sort of the thing we did have those reactions too. like, well, why didn't you press him on this? And like, I was like, it's not really my job to like, you know, uphold some sort of like, uh, virtue or justice or perceived virtue or justice or something, because, you know, I feel like as the host of, of the podcast and the podcast is called finding harmony, you know, it's not about calling people out, um, or even calling people in necessarily is sort of meeting people where they're at in their journey. And if that's your truth, I want to like hold a space for people to like be able to speak their truth and step into it and own it and like make peace within themselves, you know, with this, these divergent or disparaging parts, different parts of, of their personality or their past or whatever. Right. And so, um, so I don't really feel like it's it's up to me to like kind of you know ra- rake someone over the coals. <laughs> over, well, I mean, I, I know firsthand <laughs> about all of this because in the past I I did think it was my role to do that, and I enjoyed it. And in a way, it would it would create buzzes or whatever. Like people would get mad on both sides, and and I used right. to think when everybody's mad at me, I'm doing a great job. And I like <laughs> like being this provocateur or something. But over yeah. time. The internet changed some, I think. And I also think for myself, at a certain point, I didn't, I didn't like it so much anymore. If it's for mm. the reasons that you're saying, like, who, who am I? <laughs> you know, <they're> like, <laughs> and also I just felt that it was, it wasn't like resonating, like the frequency I, yeah. I wanted the show to be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Were you feeling, I always wonder that because, you know, I, I'm tend to be one of those people that like, don't watch the news or, or any of it. Cause of, I just feel, I feel that like negative kind of yeah. <laughs> vibration so Polarizing. intensely. Yeah yeah. 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 And so I'm, I'm curious, did you feel like it was kind of like starting to drain you a little bit? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it did not only drain me, it like came back at me, you know what I mean? I mm. tackling yeah. certain topics or, even just, you know, for me, it's like not wanting to have an adversarial dynamic between me and the people who come on. Right. Like yes. the first time I had, and it's ironic, you know, one of the first times it happened was when I had Keno McGregor on. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's because so funny. honestly, I, you know, she came on and then she had second thoughts about wanting it to go out. And then I, I, it was one of the only times where someone wasn't happy. Right. With like what we recorded. And I did decide to put it out. And she ultimately came around because a lot of people were really supportive. A lot of people yeah. liked it, you know? She kind of came around on it even after. Yeah. But it was a moment where I was like, oh, we even had to like look up legally. Can she sue me or whatever? Like, but oh, it, no. it was a bad feeling. 
I don't want to have that feeling around the show. I want people to feel like, even if I challenge them or we don't agree on stuff, Mm -hmm. that they were among a friend or something that it wasn't like adversarial. Like, can we have like respectful debates and, and be caring about each other, even if we don't agree on stuff or whatever, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I think that's so helpful. And, and honestly, that's sort of always kind of my position. And it's, you know, it's not that I don't have opinions about things because I definitely do, but I also kind of feel like I don't necessarily am going to stand behind that my opinion's right or that it's not never going to change either. <laughs> and so I, I like to allow that same grace for other people, especially like when we're, you know, recording things, it's like, you know, you can, you can say what you want and be who you want to be that day. And, and whoever you are is fine. And, you know, it's not, it's not written in stone and it's also, you know, not going to, be something that I'm going to be like, well, that's wrong. Cause I mean, who am I to like hold that space of rightness? You know, I hear you. And again, I don't, I don't want anybody's experience of coming on the show to be like crappy. Like I don't want them to feel shitty about it. I want them to have felt good about coming on, you know, of course. Yeah. And, you know, going back to it, I, I do, I, I hear your little bit of pushback or criticism about Eddie, but I would also say that I thought his criticisms of the pedagogy Mm, mm -hmm. and of like the group dynamics that happened as things got bigger and institutionalized. And honestly, Ross too, your husband's name is Ross. Is that right? Uh, Russell. Russell. Sorry, not Ross. Russell. (laughs) Russell and Eddie both like the, I don't know, just the honesty around their own misgiving in it. You know what I mean? Like to me, it just felt like the transpar- that kind of transparency and the kind of shifting of the dynamic from the guru to the spiritual friend like you guys were talking about, mm, mm-hmm. that seems the only safe ground for yoga teachers to be on yes. in, in the aftermath of all of this, you know? Yeah, and I, I loved that part of it too. And, and I, I understand also why Eddie made such a strong pivot away from <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the house of Patavi Joyce, you know, even if he was one of the main builders. Um, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, he's a very, you know, public figure. Um, New York City, there's a lot of, you know, public relation problems with being associated with Patavi Joyce at all in yeah. any kind of way, shape, or form. So I totally understand that perspective. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I guess it yeah. took him a while to get there, <laughs> whatever, but like, yeah. I yeah. guess that's you the gotta thing. You got to make your own I, way. <laughs> that's the thing. Why does everything, I don't know, that's where I've softened. When I said I softened, yeah. is this idea like he was supposed to get there in an instant? I, I don't right. know. And, you know, I guess I know other folks who are still like in that house, you know? Oh, for and sure. They're, Me they're too. They're very happy in that house. And <laughs> yeah. I like them. They're great people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So again, it's, he, he was, he, he didn't hold back, let's say on his criticisms of that lineage tradition, as you say, that he built a career on. Yeah. Yeah. You know? No, and I think, I mean, and it was good and they're all legit too. So it yeah, was, yeah. It was uh, it, yeah, it was just really fascinating. And it's interesting also kind of what it, what it brings up, like you said, in yourself, you know, what your reactions mm. are. And we had a lot of people that were like, yeah, right on. That's so good. You know, it's so great that he's in a completely new direction and doing things in a different way and really leading this new sort of group and new sort No, but of he didn't want to be the leader. He said he doesn't <laughs> want to be the one at the top, remember? See, that's the point. <laughs> yes, but, but he also said that he has no problem with hierarchy. So that's also very interesting. Yeah. I know, but the, but you guys are clear about what you meant by hierarchy. I, yeah. I don't know, but I guess I guess there's still that in there. But I, yeah. I don't know. If, what I would say is when I say that I was moved by it and I thought it was significant, I don't mean to say like, all's forgiven or whatever. Like, I mean that to hear people, even someone like Eddie, to talk like that candidly, you know, yeah. even if it's flawed. Like, yeah, so that's the thing so with powerful. podcasts. Like, people, <laughs> you get to see people's flaws when we do mm-hmm. unscripted conversations like this. Totally. Um, that's kind totally. of their power. And, and it means having to allow for people to not be perfect. And sometimes the internet's become this like puritanical space or something. 
Yes, 100%. I'm, I'm all for allowing for <laughs> imperfection. <laughs> we have to because nobody's fucking perfect. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Perfection's an illusion. So it's, it's, good well, to, it's good to tear it down every now and again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's kind of one of the appeals of podcasting when, it, when people do it without scripting it too tightly and they let themselves be shown. You know, like for yeah. me, that's when I think it gets exciting. And I guess I'm curious, you know, how, I don't, and if you don't really want to talk about this, we can totally pivot. I have like some other things I want to talk to you about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like just to say, like we can totally pass on this. I, I honestly have had these conversations many times before and, and, and sometimes they've, they've already been had and they don't need to be rehashed. But mm-hmm. since we did start with me mentioning that podcast with Eddie <laughs> and he did kind of crucify, not crucify, if that's the right word, <laughs> but he skewered a lot of things about the community. Yeah. Are you, do you, how do you relate to that community? Are you, or do you still feel yourself deeply in that? And, and then also in, in relationship, you said you got feedback. Was the feedback from within the community or from without the community or both? I would say, I mean, you know, I, I love this idea of community too. And we kind of I, talked about that right, on the it podcast even exist. as well. Is there right? even a community? That's a good <laughs> yeah. question. And like, what does it mean to be within the community or without, or like know. outside of the community at this point? I don't know. I'm not really sure. Is that the sure. certification? Is that the Sherat <laughs> stamp of approval? I mean, I guess that's the difference, right? Yeah. And like, is the community only people that like have gone to my store? Is the community people that have practiced a shtung in the past, but don't practice it anymore? Is mm. it... Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that that's actually a lot of what our podcast kind of addresses in a very roundabout way. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, it's sort of like we have this very extensive, expansive yoga community full of people who have at one point maybe practiced Ashtanga yoga and whether they still practice or don't practice anymore. Um, you know, for me, I feel like you're you're in the, you're the community. Like if you're practicing yoga, you're the community. And and I'm not so um, bent on it being specifically Ashtanga yoga at this mm-hmm. point, like following this set se- sequence of postures. I'm more focused on it being Ashtanga yoga in that you're trying to like uphold these eight limbs and live yoga in your life. And mm. that's, what's interesting to me is how does this practice express itself in your life you know how does it help you find true integration well that's beautiful that actually is a a nice transition in a way towards the philosophical stuff i want to talk with you about today (laughs) i guess one related question as we get there is you know how much because i know you studied eastern philosophy like Mm -hmm. uh, as an academic level Mm -hmm. and i guess because I remember having conversation with other people who had studied with Patabi Joyce and in that under his uh, grandson, and they talked about how they didn't actually learn a lot of that stuff from them, that it was really the sequences and the practices. And it wasn't like, there wasn't like a lot of Dharma talks or like (laughs) instruction about Patanjali's yoga sutras or any of that stuff. And I'm curious Did you get any of that when you were more in the, you know, going to Mysore or was it other studies that, that you were combining with that practice? I'm kind of curious about that in terms of the the combination of the physical practice and then like the sort of more spiritual aspects of yoga. Yeah, I would say like typically um, the time that I spent in Mysore in, you know, um, the Joy Shala, whether it was, you know, being head up by Patabi Joyce or Sharat Joyce or Saraswati Rangaswamy, any of them, um, you know, the time in the practice shala was quite physical. I mean, it was very focused on the physical discipline of the asana practice. Um, once a week, there was always a big group conference that would focus on sort of question and answer. And people would ask different questions where, you know, basically you'd kind of talk about diet or there'd be like very minimal kind of philosophical um, statements made. And I, I think, you know, what I, I would say the big takeaway of like, you know, (laughs) over 15 trips in Mysore or whatever, (laughs) the big takeaway for me is always comes back to something that Patabi Joyce would say over and over and over and over again, um, which is you take practice, you think God. And that was like 
to me, sort of, I guess, if you want like a philosophical essence of the teachings there, to me, that was, that was sort of it. It was like, your mind should be centered on God, whatever that means to you. And you should be, you know, living the yoga in your life, you know, take practice doesn't just mean stand on your yoga mat and do asanas every day. It, it means that it's a full integration, right? It's mind and body. And it's something that you're doing all day long. Um, but to answer your question more directly and specifically, yes, I did study philosophy with other teachers in India. You know, there was quite a few different teachers that I studied with and, and studied Ayurveda as well. And and chanting in Sanskrit. And um, those classes were mainly held by independent professors that were not associated in direct um, connection with the shala there. Mm, interesting. Well, it's so amazing to me that you, so early on in this conversation, even dropped the G word. Because <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about because I heard you in some of your episodes, you know, mentioning that you, your, your parents were like first into meditation, but then like born again, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I grew up in a like cons modern conservative Jewish household. I had a bar mitzvah, but I had nice. already rejected the religion before I got to yoga. Like when I was 16, I have this really specific memory of being in temple on a high holy day mm -hmm. and reading the translations of all these prayers that I knew by heart that I had never really looked at the translations before. Right. And having this epiphany of like, I don't believe any of this. <laughs> and like telling my dad that I didn't believe it anymore. But in any case, I guess my question around this is, is that, you know, and I, this, I, people who listen to the show are probably tired of hearing me say this, but <laughs> it just seems like before the pandemic hit, I hate that. I always have to reference that shit, but that's true. Yeah. It's a divide a, in history <laughs> at this point. <laughs> but in any case, there was um, this period of time where I think that I, in myself, it was always still there, but definitely in my teaching and in my like public presentation, mm -hmm. I moved away from what I would call like devotional aspects mm -hmm. or more mystical aspects mm -hmm. of practice because it's like, it didn't sell, you know what I mean? It made you weird. Like it was all functional <laughs> movement and vagal tone. You know what I'm saying? Right, it right. wasn't about chanting and like feeling spirit or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And more recently over the last few years, that's actually been the thing I have personally needed most. Mm -hmm. And like yeah. then wanting to feel more confident about being more forward facing about that. But the, the, the thing is that the reason it gets problematic is because it starts to feel like religion. Yeah. Or it feels like a little woo woo. <laughs> it, well, even if you can get around the woo woo, even if you can yeah. find the right words to get around the woo woo thing, it yeah. starts, to, it's, it starts to feel like yoga becomes like religion. And I've always been one of those people's like yoga is not religion. And I, I mm. think that's true to some degree, but it, there's aspects of practice that mm -hmm. are of a sort. So I guess the question I have for you, and I think you've spoke about this before mm -hmm. is that it does feel to me like, I've heard people say, oh, there's yoga in all the religions. Like you can find chakras in the Kabbalah and there's different right. <laughs> Gnostic sects of Christianity that are like non-dual or whatever, that, like there's yoga in every religion. But to me, and I'm curious if you agree, mm -hmm. there's something very fundamentally different about like a, the Western Judeo-Christian frame of how you exist in the world and an Eastern frame. Yeah. So it's interesting. That was something that I was thinking about actually just this week in relation to sort of how we understand even like what it means to be a spiritual person or, you know, what it means to be enlightened. And I think sometimes from our like Judeo-Christian point of view, it means, you know, being of service to our fellow human beings, right? Like there's a service component. There's a um, like this karma yoga becomes very important 
um, to us in a way, right? That you should be nice and you should be good and truthful and like all the things that come from that sort of monotheistic understanding of God and, and the Ten Commandments or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and if I you think, don't, you'll be judged. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's where we get a lot of the Ashtanga guilt from, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, in, in Eastern philosophy, it's it's not really like that. There's not sin and there's not really like good and evil per se. Um, you know, there's beings of light and beings of, I guess you'd say, sort of you know, darkness or more like selfishness. Right. Mm. Um, but both can be kind of like very high, highly spiritual, enlightened beings. And so you have all these stories and myths about, um, you know, certain ascetics or certain practitioners who do these, you know, a lot of asceticism and then become like these incredible, you know, superhuman <laughs> sort of beings that, you know, nobody can be, defeat them, but they're actually very selfish and kind of like, you know, demonic in a way. Mm. But demonic doesn't necessarily mean like evil or going to hell. It just means they're not really concerned about anybody but themselves, which is sort of interesting. Mm. Uh, but also that like being a spiritual person or a good yoga practitioner doesn't necessarily mean like serving a community or like being of service in the world. It can be a very self-centered endeavor and that doesn't detract from your, I guess, understanding of, of spirit in a way. And I think that's really difficult for us to wrap our heads around in the West <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's very not our understanding of, of spirituality. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that there's also something for me, I mean, first of all, to your other point about um, the differences between the Eastern and the Western views, I heard you say, I, I wrote this down, that there's no judgment day in the, mm -hmm. that it's a non-linear frame yeah. in the East, <laughs> yeah. which does sort of recolor it in the way that you were describing, you know? Um, but I guess the other thing that I think about a lot is that I have identified like part of the process of me, like letting myself say things in a class that three years ago, I would have thought were just totally cheesy and I would have <laughs> never believed would come out of my mouth. Part of that process has been recognizing how much of like my Western uh, upbringing and developed in me this uh, tendency to reduce everything. It's this reductionist kind of like scientific <laughs> postmodern world of randomness viewpoint mm -hmm. where matter is dead, right? Like, mm -hmm. and what yoga seems to be about is a worldview in which matter is not dead. It's all consciousness, right? It's yeah. all alive. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and like, that just seems like such a, that's the thing that Westerners have a really hard time getting their minds around. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I it's, it's crazy, right? When you think about it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the sense of, of, you know, your mind isn't something that sits in your brain somewhere. Um, your mind is throughout your whole body, right? And even your whole physical body is infused with an energy body, which is infused with your mental, emotional sensing body, which is infused with higher intelligence. You know, you could even say that like reflexes are in a, a sense of higher intelligence, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's like just sort of that bliss, I guess, that bliss body, that place of supreme joy that we can connect to at any moment, at any time. And the only reason why we're not completely in that space of joy all the time is because we're like not focused on it. Is that supreme joy, God? I don't think so. <laughs> ah, I'm curious because like, because you said earlier that it was about keep your mind on God. And then yeah. you were just saying like being focused on a space of supreme joy. So what's the difference between God and a space of supreme joy. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I always love the Jewish idea of, and it's also a Vedic idea as well, you know, in, in the Vedas, they say neti neti, like not mm. this, not this. And mm-hmm. that's also a very Jewish um, concept, right? How like do you Talmudic, define God? Yes. Inquiries. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They're you very can't Vedic. define God. You yeah. can only define God by what God is not. Yes. Right. Because as soon as we start to label something or define it, it ends up in a box. And how can you put infinity in a box? It's impossible. So you can say all the things it's not, but you can't say what it is. Um, but you can feel it, maybe. <laughs> so maybe feeling joy is like that deep connection to sort of your divine consciousness or that divine spark within, you know, mm-hmm. feeling peace, feeling love. You know, you're entering into that kind of ineffable sacred space of yourself you know even being in relationship with people like this conversation that we're having is a sacred space of sorts and as we enter it and as we join in consciousness and energy to in togetherness i mean if you are hearing this message then you're listening to the free version of j brown yoga talks to hear the rest of our conversation please subscribe to podcast premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.